Well, if you did not receive one of the uh, gift packets from Walk Through the Bible yesterday, maybe you don't have Tuesday, Thursday classes, or you weren't able to grab one, there's a whole bunch uh, as you leave today, and there's all sorts of goodies in there. There's a CD uh, from our president, Chip Ingram, who's also a DTS grad, uh, a number of things in there to acquaint you with Walk Through the Bible. The best thing in there, I'll just tell you this, so you don't have to debate amongst yourselves what's the best thing, is a 40% off coupon for anything we produce, which is the same discount I receive as an employee, and we're able to extend that both to the faculty and to the student body of Dallas Seminary. And supposedly there's some code or something where you put in DTS on the website or something. If you have problems, call the 800 number and they'll figure it out for you, and just tell them Phil sent me, and that ought to be worth at least 3% off. So um, I have thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed being here with you this week. And I, I guess I shouldn't say that like that's a surprise, um, but this week has so far exceeded my expectations. Um, observations. This is a, there's a wonderful community here that did not exist in its fullness uh, when I was a student here. I think a lot of that is, is just having uh, the number of female students uh, represented here, which certainly improves the singing if nothing else, uh, but has, has, I think, done wonders just for the, uh, just for the feel of, of this campus and to see the, the progress that's been made in uh, buildings, to see Mark Bailey, a, a good friend of mine. I always knew he'd be good in this niche, but to see him really thrive in this role and to hear from so many different professors and administrators, um, just what a good team God has brought together here. Um, to see that, that there is a more vibrant spiritual life on campus, I believe, uh, than when I was here 25 years ago, and to realize that that doesn't have to translate into lowering academic standards. It's just different ways of glorifying God, and uh, you are blessed to be here in this place. As I told you on Tuesday, I've never one day regretted the training that I received here, and so seize every opportunity uh, that's yours here, both the formal ones in the classroom and chapel, uh, but then pursuing relationships with faculty and staff as well as fellow students. Um, you, will, you will form lifelong relationships during the time that you are here. And that's really what I'm talking about this week is mentors. I could have talked to you about uh, mentors that I met, who some of them are, are seated on the platform here still, um, others who have gone on to different ministries. I could talk to you about students that I attended school with who really helped shape me, but none of those are in the Bible, so they didn't quite make the this week. We're uh, instead, this week, we're talking about my ministry mentors, uh, four biblical characters, four friends who won't let me quit. And this morning, if um, we're going to talk about a man by the name of Simon Peter. Simon Peter, if you think about his life, it really falls into four acts. In Act 1, he's, he's off to a very promising beginning. I mean, there's the, the call of Simon Peter. There's his early time as a disciple. He um, has some experiences that not all the disciples have. He's a witness of the transfiguration, along with James and John. Uh, sure, there's those brief moments where his mouth seems to run a little faster than his brain, but um, frankly, that just endears him to me all the more uh, because my proofreading grid has had to shrink through the years, too. It used to be like chicken wire and all sorts of things would get through, and i go, come back, words, why did I release you? And now it's, you know, <laughs> down about the size of the average window screen, which is, nah, it still needs to shrink a little bit every now and then. Uh, but I, I love, I love Simon Peter. I love his boldness. I love his willingness to take a risk. Um, he gets off to such a promising start. There's that, there's that one wonderful time when, when Jesus is asking, who do people say that I am? And it's just like family feud. You know, they say top five answers on the board. And some say you were John the Baptist. Good answer, good answer. Bing, survey says 29. And, you know, they go on like that. And some say you were Elijah raised from the dead. And you remember what Simon Peter said when he was asked? You are the Christ. You're the promised Messiah. 
You're the one we've been waiting for. And, and all of us who, who love this guy, we're like, yeah, this is great. So he's off to a very promising beginning. Then he has really a, a, a tragic failure, a, a collapse, really. Um, he is told that Jesus is going to die soon. He's even told that, that you will deny Christ, that you will all scatter. And Simon Peter, never the shy one, says, um, everybody, else, everybody else may fail, not me. And certainly there's some pride in that statement. Certainly there's some ignorance, if not downright arrogance in that statement. But he, even in that, he, there's a lovability about this man. He's willing, he's willing to chop off an ear. He's willing to put his own life on the line. I'm not going to deny you. But we know that he denies his Lord three times. And in fact, if you, if you put all the Gospels together and try to reconcile some of those accounts, you can come to the conclusion that it was even more than three times. And so you read this and, and your, heart just, your heart just falls inside of you because such a promising beginning and then such a, such a tragic ending to his story. But wonderfully, that's only the second act. Act four of Simon Peter's life, you open up to Acts two and here's Pentecost and nobody really knows how to explain the supernatural signs that they're seeing. And here's Peter, it says, taking his stand with the other 11. Peter really becomes for several chapters in the book of Acts the point person for the spread of the gospel. And, and he very boldly in front of thousands of people, a potentially hostile crowd, the same one who chickened out in front of just a, a little girl a few chapters ago. The, this man now is, is full of boldness, but it's a different kind of boldness. And it's not just that he's still willing to talk, he's willing to back it up. I've been all over the world the last several years with Walk Through the Bible. I don't, I don't know how many countries, but most regions in the world, I've been privileged to go there. And one of the questions that I love to ask people is, what's your favorite book of the Bible? You know what I've discovered? To a great, great majority of the world, where the suffering church is a daily reality, First and Second Peter are loved books. They are loved books. And in fact, I heard that so many times that I, I had to think, how well do I even know these books? Because we have it so easy here in America. Who wrote those books? Simon Peter. So you see, now he has his boldness that maybe was native to his personality, but there's the depth, there's the compassion, there's the wisdom that's now coupled with this. And he ends up with a very fruitful ministry. What's the lesson for us? Well, the bottom, bottom line, and you're going to see this later on the, on the board, but the bottom line for us is that failure is neither final nor fatal. I want to talk to two distinct groups today. Group one is the obvious group to talk to. You've experienced some failure. Your classmates may not even know it. Some of your fellow profs may not know it. Um, but, but before you came here, the wheels fell off the truck. Maybe you were in a church setting and, and it just, they didn't respond well to your leadership. Maybe you're with a, a parachurch ministry, crusade, navs, IV, and you know, you just concluded, I don't know what I'm supposed to be when I grow up, but that isn't it. And you come in here wounded, really coming out of phase two, and you made some promises and you had some goals and whether it was you or whether it was God, you're still trying to sort some of that out for yourself. Your mouth and your vision wrote some checks that your giftedness couldn't cash. Or maybe your character couldn't cash. And there's a failure in your past. For others, it's, it's a moral failure. And though you didn't, you didn't hide anything on your application, you um, are hiding it from your fellow students. And you hear discussions and you, and you read about 2 Corinthians 1 about comforting others with the comfort that you've received, but you say, that door of my life has to stay closed. Uh, otherwise, what would people here think of me? That's the obvious group that this message applies to, that failure is neither final nor fatal. But there's another group, and perhaps this is an even larger group, and you go, whew, I'm glad this message doesn't apply to me. Well, bad news, it does. Because you're more like me. You're a calculator, you're a cautious person. My dad took me fishing one time years ago. I'd, I'd been married maybe six months and, and he says, we need to talk. 
And I go, oh, great. He says, I want to tell you the facts of life. I'm like, Dad, I've been married six months. What would you like to know? I'll try to make it clear for you, you know? And, and this is, oh, so awkward, please. And, and he says, um, you need to fail more. He says, I passed on to you something I never meant to. He's an actuary by trade. Actuaries calculate how long people are going to live so that we know how much to charge them for their life insurance. And he says, only trouble is I've lived my whole life as an actuary. And if I couldn't foresee a positive outcome, I wouldn't take the first step down that road. And he says, you inherited that from me. I said, what are you talking about? And he says, I know that when you tried out for high school football, he says, you really didn't show up after the first day because you didn't think you could make it. And so you pretended to go the rest of the week. He says, I know there were other sports teams. He goes, you could have played basketball in high school, but you weren't positive, and so you didn't even go out. He says, you got that from me. You got to remember, for every time that Peter sinks in the water because he takes his eyes off Christ, there's 11 other disciples in the boat going, whew, I'm glad I didn't step out there. And the body of Christ is desperate for people who are willing to take godly risks. And every one of us in this room need this message today that failure is neither final nor fatal. Some of you are challenging my mathematic ability because you're going, okay, we got scene one, scene two, scene four. What happened in scene three? There's the pay dirt. Whatever happens in scene three is the key to moving from two to four, from terrible failure to fruitful ministry. If you have your Bible, open it up to John 21, because here is Act 3 of Peter's life, and it's in absolute living color. There's so, so, so much in here, and there's such a wonderful glimpse of our Savior and His heart. This is such a, to me, this is such a worshipful chapter. This chapter makes me love Jesus uh, even more, just reading it almost casually. John 21. This is start at the top of the chapter. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. You remember, there, Jesus has been buried. There's rumors of his resurrection. He's had a couple of appearances at this point. But to, to think that the disciples are suddenly full of faith is to do a great deal of injustice to the real progress of the development of faith in a human's life. They're in process. They don't know where are we going to go, what are we going to do. We've left everything. And in verse 3, Peter says, I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Stay right there for a minute. You don't want to read too much into this, and, I, and especially with my esteemed colleagues all around here, but there's something to this deal that Peter wants to go back fishing because he's left this lifestyle. There was a, a turning point in his life where Jesus told him, follow me and I will make you fishers of what? Men, not bass, not carp, not trout anymore. And so here he is and, and he says, I, I'm going out fishing. And sure, this could be just a harmless diversion, but then I look in my own life, and you know what I do? Whenever I've experienced failure, my instant reaction is I'm going to go do something I know I can do well. And I believe that's exactly what Simon Peter's going here. At, I tried this fishing for men stuff. It doesn't work. They don't respond well. In fact, the person who was mentoring me, and I left that career for this, I don't even know what's become of him. And all the dreams that I had and all the hopes for our, for our nation those have all been dashed. I'm going out to fish. The other said, we'll go too. And you wonder if that was good news to Simon Peter or not. Because as people-oriented as, as he appears to be, whew, when you're down, you just want to be alone. But off they go with him. That night they caught what? Nothing. Zero. And there's a lesson here for us that, that's so clear. That, that lesson is this. Before God lets us succeed where we failed, he oftentimes makes us fail where we used to succeed. I've experienced that. 
There were times pastoring when I thought, ooh, you know, I was pre-med before somebody got me in that navigator's Bible study, and I started, I started leading one one time, and somebody gave me tapes from this Dallas Seminary place, and I went and visited and had to preach and all that good stuff and ended up here in the middle of the cornfields. You know what? At least at the end of the day, a doctor can keep score. How many lived? How many died? And with people, it's like, how do you measure growth? I started gardening, not because I like to garden. I just wanted to see something tangibly grow. <laughs> and anything that threatened it, I wanted to be able to hack it away. <laughs> and there were many times, especially in about the first five years of ministry, where, where I would be alone in my office, and um, I would think, I wonder, I wonder if I could dust off my transcripts I might have to take a few more courses, but I started out pre-med. I was perfectly happy pre-med. God veered me off. At least I thought it was God. Now I'm not even sure God did it. I mean, this wife of mine, I met her, first date. What do you think you'll be when you grow up? She says, I've always known I'd marry somebody in the ministry. It's like, okay, I'll switch majors. And, you know, <laughs> maybe that influenced me too much. I don't know. And, There was one time, I've told very few people about this, there was one time I actually asked a doctor, can I shadow you for two days? He had no idea why, he thought I was just collecting sermon illustrations. I was seriously considering a major career change because I was so jealous that his work was tangible and measurable. And you know what happened during those two days? There was nothing fulfilling about that at all. I'm like, so basically, even on a good day, all you do is drag it out for people, make it a little more comfortable, but death has very impressive stats. One out of every one people die. <laughs> and he goes, yeah. He goes, you're a doctor of the soul. You're dealing with eternal things. He goes, I, I wish I could trade places with you. I go, uh, you about have a deal. <laughs> Can I have the diplomas on your wall, streamline this process a little bit? That's a, true, that's a truism. Before he lets us succeed where we failed, he lets us fail where we used to succeed. During one of these really tough times, one of the men from our church goes, come here, hop in my truck. I hop in his truck and we drive out in this timber and we come upon this stake that's about this far out of the ground. And he says, kick it. And I kicked it, it barely even vibrated. I said, how deep is that? He says, about seven feet high. He says, one of the times when our church, he says, I don't know if you've read the old minutes, our church would get off the ground, crash, off the ground, crash. And he says, finally, we built this new building. And he says, and then I had a terrible, terrible failure and frustration. And when God taught me a big lesson, I came and drove this stake in. And he says, I, I come and kick it now and then. He goes, you can kick my stake anytime you want because God's going to build his church here. And I think you're supposed to be a part of it. I said, what happened, what happened? He goes, oh, it's stupid. He says, read the old minutes. He says, there was one time we had just built our building. We got to fighting about something. And he says, the whole board resigned. He says, me too. And he says, I'll, I still want to serve God. I said, I'll grow the grass. I'll plant the grass in the new church. And, he, and I, he says, I can grow stuff. And I said, I know. You should see his house. It's like Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. He was like, wah, wah, wah. I mean, there's all these birds flying around. I go, you can grow things. And he says, I planted the grass. And he says, would you believe it didn't come up? He says, I planted it again. And he goes, this time, I'm embarrassed to tell you the kind of chemicals I poured on this grass. He says, and it came up and then it died. He says, I planted a third time and it died. And he says, there was one night in the middle of the night, he says, I was on my face out in the front yard of the church with clumps of dirt in my hand, almost cursing God, saying, it's bad enough you won't let me grow a church for you. You won't even let me grow grass for the front of the church. And he says, it's as close as I've ever come to hearing God say, you could ask me for my help. What did God do? Before he let him succeed where he had failed, growing a church, he let him realize that lesson, that, that our need isn't partial, it's total. Without me, you can do nothing. And Simon Peter had to learn this here. Anybody like to fish? I know this is something that 
quickly gets pushed out of our schedule as seminarians. Three things every fisherman hates. They, they're all right here. This is so hilarious. First thing a fisherman hates is to catch nothing, right? That night they caught nothing, so we're one for one. Look at verse 4. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. Second thing you hate, it's bad enough to get skunked. Then you pray that you see nobody at the dock on the way to your car. The second thing we hate is for somebody to then ask you, how'd you do? The, the, see, the trouble with none is you cannot exaggerate zero. <laughs> My son is really good. I'll go, well, how, how big was that bass? And he'll go, like this big? You know, and he'll, he'll show me. And, and then you look and you go, wait a minute, which was it? And you're, uh, this. I go, what's this hand for? He goes, it's just kind of there. <laughs> but how do you exaggerate zero? You can't. You can't say, I didn't do quite as well as we'd hoped we'd do. Well, how many? Zero. 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 You know what else we hate? Verse 6. He said, Jesus, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. It's bad enough not to catch any fish. It's bad enough to be asked, how'd you do? And then when you're finished, for somebody to go, well, I'll tell you what you should have done differently. <laughs> we fished three days out in Oregon one time. My brother and his wife, my wife and me, it, it was so bad. We caught nothing for three days, except sticks and twigs and stuff. And, and my wife was like, you guys are so insecure. She goes, look at all the fish they have. She goes, I'll go borrow them for our pictures. And there's these pictures of my brother and me <laughs> with a borrowed stringer of fish. It's so sad. <laughs> and those people going, oh, you needed a cheese egg with a marshmallow. Orange marshmallow, cheese egg, we're not going to be dead. It's like, shut up. We don't want to hear that now. <laughs> Maybe two days ago. Jesus says, throw your net on the other side. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Just by the way, does this remind anybody of a previous event? When did something a whole lot like this happen? Peter's original calling as a disciple. Hmm, that's interesting. What a coincidence. Verse 7, Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. I wonder if he expected to just walk across. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. The other disciples followed in the boat, this is typical, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Again, a, a big topic in conversations this week is, is, Phil, how did you learn to preach narratives? You learn to preach narratives by reading the passage over and over and over and over and over and really looking for details. And then you put yourself in the story and go, what did it feel if, like if you were this person? I wonder what he was thinking. You've got to use your imagination a little bit. A very interesting detail here. If my study is correct, there's only one other time in scriptures where this word for burning coals or some translations have charcoal fire appears. Anybody know where that is? They were warming themselves by a fire one of the times when Peter denied Christ. Coincidence? Mm, I kind of doubt it since in the next verses we count and we find out we have 153 fish. Somebody's concerned a lot about details in here. Jesus says to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Verse 11, Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of, well, stay there for a minute. Isn't it interesting, though, that Jesus already had bread and fish? Wouldn't it have been nice of him to go, I'm really, really hungry, and you have fish. Let's have breakfast. But I think even in this detail, there's a little bit of a lesson for us, that we're not in ministry because he needs us. We're in ministry because he loves us, because he knows it does us tremendous good. But it's not like he's running around going, oh no, 
Michael got a B minus in Old Testament introduction. I had such high hopes for my church. My church is ruined. <laughs> Jessica, I don't know what's her, her, her project in Christian Ed is two days late. Gabriel, bring me the Maylocks. This could be it for <laughs> ministry in Asia as I had dreamed of it for 20 years from now. He doesn't need us. It's his grace that he uses us. Well, Jesus, uh, uh, nobody dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and he did the same with the fish. Again, not the first time they've seen him pass bread and fish out to people. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. No doubt this must have been a real time of joy, but I wonder what Simon Peter was thinking all through this meal. I wonder if he even enjoyed it. Did he even eat? Because he'd made some really bold promises, and when crunch time came, he had choked royally. And, and there's, that, there's that barrier there. There's that sense of failure. Verse 15, Jesus isn't going to leave him in this condition. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? And again, you can build strong evidence to two different meanings of the word these. Is he referring to the other disciples? Because Simon Peter had said, everybody else may deny you, but I never will. Clearly implying that his love must have been superior, or at least his courage must have been superior, his faith. Or does the these refer to this life of fishing, which supposedly he had left because he loved Jesus and people more? And I find that delightfully ambiguous, because in, in my life I've had both those struggles. Comparisons to other people, but also, am I really going to put my hand to the plow and keep it there? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my lambs. I still have a ministry for you. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Verse 17, the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because he asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Really interesting verse follows, verse 18. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. When you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. My dad says he wants that verse on his wheelchair when he gets in a wheelchair. <laughs> Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, not feed my sheep this time, but follow me. When had he said follow me to Jesus before? Remember in Matthew, when he's called? Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus called these folks for two reasons. First of all, that they would be with him. That's the disciple role, but also that he would send them out. That's the apostle role. One of the things that has to live in tension in your life and ministry is the tension between those two things. You're so eager right now to be sent out that you want to microwave the disciple role. Realize he has blessed you with the years that you have here. Yes, to be prepared to be sent out, but primarily right now to be with him. But the folly in our thinking is that then that phase completes and then we get sent out and we don't have to be disciples anymore. The first time Simon Peter experienced this event with Jesus with the miraculous catch of fish, you remember his response? He fell down and he said, get away from me for I'm a sinful man. But sometime along the way, maybe Peter started to realize his own giftedness. When I preach, people actually respond. We do have authority over demons. God's used my hands to heal. And somewhere along the way, he lost track of the source of all of that power. 
and he really believed that he was a reservoir rather than a river. And so Jesus takes him back to the very heart of it all. If you want a great study, take the accounts of the calling of Simon Peter and put them in parallel with this chapter and look at how many things are similar. Jesus has taken him right back to the very beginning of their relationship. And it's interesting that the last words are not feed my sheep or take care of my lambs. As important as that is, the last words are follow me because ultimately that role of disciple is even more important than to be sent out in the name of Jesus. Well, I said that this message was for two groups. Both groups need the same message, that failure is neither final nor fatal. If you are a calculator like me, if you are one man or woman who loves to know the outcome before you're going to take the first step, realize that there are great parts of God's character we'll never experience. And that's a shame. That's a shame. Be encouraged by Simon Peter that after the pain of Act 4, there was the glorious restoration of Act 3 and the wonderful ministry of Act 4. And you wonder, would there have been the depth in Act 4, the impact of his ministry, especially to the suffering church around the world today, if there hadn't been the pain of Act 2? I don't believe there would have. So that even his time of failure is used by God to prepare him for his great ministry. And I think a whole lot of the flesh got burned off of Simon Peter through this process. So take some risks. Take some risks. Attempt some ministries that some people would say you're not even ready for yet. Get out there a little closer to the edge. Don't wait till you graduate to have a ministry. It's okay to have some trial and error. It's okay to go, well, there's 11 million possible ministries, and I now know three that I'm not gifted for. That's how the light bulb was invented. You got to weed out all the ways not to make light before you figure out how to turn one on. But to that group who would say, wow, I should have been a better calculator. I, I, I identify with this too much because I've let the Lord down. And you're carrying that private burden. And I don't, I don't know what it is that can be a failure in ministry. It can even be a moral failure. There are no doubt DTS students who have abortions in their past. There are DTS students who have immoral relationships in their past. There's all, all sorts of things that God wants to use for his glory by redeeming it. You know, if the church is like a sport, I've been thinking about this lately, it's most like a hockey game. And I'm not a big hockey fan. How you ever ended up with a hockey team in Dallas? I'm very confused. We have one in Atlanta, they tell us. We've never actually seen them. But. <laughs> you know, most sports, if somebody messes up, commits a foul, what do you do? You substitute for them. Basketball, even five fouls, what do you do? You bring in a new player off the bench. Only hockey is such that if you commit, let's say you trip somebody, you go where? To the penalty box. Two minutes, tripping. Your team doesn't get to replace you. And you skate as a team shorthanded. For the other team, that's called a power play because their odds of scoring a goal uh, greatly increase because they have one additional player on the ice. Here's what happens most time in the church. This happens all too often. We commit a foul. Because of his love for us, what does God do? He disciplines us. He sends us to the penalty box. And sometimes he sets us down from ministry for a while. He takes something away from us. He disciplines us. But in that penalty box, there's a, a great time of learning. There's repentance takes place. Imagine it like this in hockey, that at the end, in the end of that two minutes, you stay there in the penalty box. And the ref skates by and goes, your two minutes is up. Get, get back out there. Uh, uh, thanks. And then you still sit there. And your players skate by and you're like, hello, look at the clock. Your penalty's over. And you go, oh, I don't, it, it wasn't just tripping. It was premeditated tripping. <laughs> I tripped that man on purpose. It was not an accident, though. I went like this. It, it, was, it was malicious intent. 
and, and everybody on your team is going, we are dying out here. The enemy is overwhelming us. We're all in different roles that we don't belong in because you've got abilities that you're sitting on in the penalty box. You've got to get out here. And the ref is going, son, you, you have served your time. Get out there. Oh, but I still feel so terrible about what I did. That's one reason the church of Jesus Christ is so very weak in America. You know how to tell the difference who you're listening to? Whether it's, whether it's conviction from the Holy Spirit or condemnation from Satan, this is so clear and this has helped me so much. God will always start with who you are, your identity. You're my son, you're my daughter, You've been bought with a price. You're a royal priesthood. Now look at what you did over here. This is inconsistent with your identity, who you are. This behavior, this attitude needs to change and be brought in alignment with your identity. He always works that direction. Satan, the great counterfeiter, takes that and distorts it. He always starts with the behavior. He says, look what you did. You're a professor. You visited that internet site? Look, look at what you did. You, you cheated on a paper? You're, you're preparing for the ministry and you cheated on a paper. Look, look at that. You know what that shows me? It shows me no way are you a leader. In fact, I'm not even sure that you're an authentic believer in Jesus Christ. He always takes the behavior and uses it to attack our identity. Holy Spirit takes our identity, shows us how the behavior attitude doesn't line up with the identity. Whatever became of Simon Peter anyway? We love the guy. We love the guy because he's so real. We love the guy because of how God used him. We also love him because we know about his failure and we know about his struggle. And it brings great hope to every one of us who have disappointed God at one time or another. And to those who are going, whoo, Ooh, that's a scary ride to take. I think I'll just stay here in the boat and see whether he sinks or swims. I realize you're just missing out on about 90% of the Christian life. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for not hiding truth from us in the scriptures. Thank you for not just fast forwarding to the happy endings all the time. Thank you for not skipping the part that's messy and difficult. Even if it didn't make it into our Sunday school quarterlies, Lord, we've got to be real about how you actually work in our lives now that we're at seminary. Lord, I pray that for some who have been in the penalty box way too long, your discipline's over. There may be ministries that are still closed. We, that's a different issue than today. The point is, you are looking us in the eye saying, feed my sheep. Follow me. I've still got a ministry for you, but above all, I want you to be my disciple. And for those who are just living life so safe, so risk averse, so afraid of making a mistake, may we realize that you are a compassionate Savior who delights in second chances and new beginnings. And may we fall in love with the 21st chapter of John. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.